everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is another installment in the Sewing Through the Decade series, and if you're unfamiliar with this series then I will link a video up above that explains it in great detail. But basically, I'm sewing my way through the 20th century, one decade at a time, using original vintage patterns as a guide. And today we are finally getting into my favorite decade, at least when it comes to fashion in the 20th century, which is the 1940s. Even though a lot of 1940s dresses look similar, I feel like it was one of the more creative periods for fashion, because there were so many limitations on the material available, people got really creative when it comes to dart placement and gathers and seeming details in general. Though the pieces don't necessarily have the drama of A-line dresses from the 1950s, I think they have a certain charm to them. I've tried to incorporate a lot of original 1940s pieces in my wardrobe, and I was really excited to finally get to the decade where I could make some pieces too. So there are going to be quite a few videos that cover the 1940s since I favor it so greatly. But we're starting off with pattern number 3170, which is from an unnamed mail order brand. Mail order patterns were incredibly popular in the first half of the 20th century. Oftentimes, mail order patterns would ship in the actual pattern envelope. So if you ever see a vintage pattern that looks like it has postmarks on it, that's why. However, this one probably shipped in an unlabeled envelope that was just used for the mailing. The actual pattern illustration itself and all of the instructions are printed on a single folded sheet of paper. I picked this pattern because I thought it was a really classic example of 1940s day wear. I think many women would have had several dresses like this that they would wear around the house and on a very regular basis. It isn't the most exciting pattern considering how much detail went to garments in the 1940s, but I do think it's a good example of what garments were like. And trust me, I will be taking on some more interesting patterns for this period in the very near future. Since this is such a simple pattern, I don't have a lot to say about it, so I'm just going to get into the video and I really hope that you enjoy. And if you'd like to support this series and get early access to these videos, then definitely check out my Patreon. It is funding this whole thing, and there's always a link to it in the description box. So as I said, this is a mail order pattern. It doesn't have an envelope, just a step-by-step -step guide and illustration that the pieces are folded inside of. Though the brand isn't labeled, this is pattern 3107 and it's in size 36, intended for a 36 inch bust. The step-by-step -step guide, as they call it, is printed on a waxy paper and includes material requirements, cutting guides, as well as some limited instructions on the assembly process and required techniques like bound buttonholes. Those were plentiful in the 1940s. I would describe the instructions for this as wordy. They are broken up into so-called steps, but each step consists of a half dozen actions. To make it easier to follow, I retype the instructions and organize them into specific steps. Even though the formatting of the text left something to be desired, I did appreciate the diagrams included. Those make a world of difference. Like the majority of the patterns in this project, this pattern is unmarked and uses perforations to indicate the placement of darts, tucks, pleats, buttonholes, and hems, instead of the ink which is used on more modern patterns. For fabric, I picked a floral material from the 1930s collection at Joann's. I love this material, and I don't think it's inaccurate for the 40s, but the dress definitely has a 30s-ish feel to it, thanks to this, which I probably should have considered. But no regrets, I think it's cute. I didn't end up following their cutting diagrams, but I did take my time laying out the fabric. This pattern called for 4.5 yards of fabric, and I had three and a half, so it was a little tight. I didn't even have enough material left to make a matching belt, so I definitely, quite literally, cut it close. Here you can see me pinning all the pieces on, then cutting it out. This pattern actually fit me really well, so I didn't have to worry about adding additional seam allowance for once. This was helped by the fact that I decided to assemble this without French seams, since a lot of the garments I've been purchasing from the 1940s don't have any seam finishing whatsoever. After cutting everything out, I cut the notches and transferred important perforations, that's a mouthful, onto the majority of the pieces. Though I followed their instructions pretty closely, I didn't follow the order of them. I was concerned about the fit of the skirt, so I decided to work on it first, starting with the pockets. They say to turn in one inch at upper edge of pocket and hem, which is exactly what I did. Then I decided to be a little bit extra and added lace one inch away from the top edge. Then 
That wasn't enough for me, Angela, the lace monster. So I also added these applique bows to the center of each pocket. And I stitched a contrasting button in the middle to incorporate a different texture. And I did all of this by hand to avoid visible top stitching. Then they say, baste under half inch at unnotched side and lower edge of pocket. So I stitched a half inch away from those edges to create a guideline. Then I folded and ironed the edges inward across the line of stitching. This is called being too lazy to baste things. Because hand sewing lace to make ridiculous pockets is my jam, but taking 30 seconds to baste an edge, that's just a total waste of time. That's some serious lace monster logic right there. <laughs> That just about finishes off the pocket so we can move on to the skirt. They say, seam center front of panel 9, match VVV. Then they want me to align the notches and base the pockets to the side front panels. I had some trouble figuring this out with my mock-up since the pockets aren't shown in the views of the dress, but one of the edges is incorporated into the side front seams. And again, I'm pinning the pockets on instead of basting them. The pockets get sewn on by machine, leaving the edge incorporated into the seam and the top edge free, so it can work as a pocket. Then everything else is pinned. The back panels are pinned to the side back panels, and the front panels are pinned to the side front panels. They were stitched together with half inch seam allowances. I love it when patterns have half inch seam allowances. It feels like they're meant for me. And everything was ironed. I don't think I filmed a lot of ironing this time around, but rest assured I ironed every single seam every single time. Now they want me to match the V and large O and leave left seam free above O. So basically pin and sew the side seams, but leave a portion open at the side to allow for a placket later on. Did I forget to mention that this pattern has both buttons down the front and a side closure? Because I'm going to mention that a lot since I think it's really dumb. That finished off the skirt. I did a fitting and it looked pretty nice, so I could start from the beginning of their instructions and begin work on the bodice, like they wanted me to do in the first place. So let's start with the very first step. It says, stitch 3 16th of an inch tucks at neck of back 1 on small O, stitch to 1 8th inch at lower ends. Baste large O to small O at upper edge of front, baste under half inch, lower edge of yoke 2, clip seam on curve. Top stitch 2 over upper edge of 3, match V and VV. I think in the 1940s they had bigger things to worry about than formatting and punctuation. Not that I really blame them, there were wars going on. And that's actually half of what they consider step one. But a lot happens there, starting with pinning and sewing tucks into the back panel. Then I transferred markings from the pattern onto the front bodice panel and used those markings as a guide for pleating the panels at the top edges. And these are simple knife pleats. For the yoke, I used a pencil to mark a line one inch away from the edge. Then I clipped the edge and used my iron to fold the edge upward until it touched that line. I pinned the pieces together from the wrong side with the raw edges even, then transferred the pins to the front so I could see them while I was sewing. I stitched these pieces together as close to the edge as I could. Now it said match V, ease one. So basically match the shoulder notches and ease the front panel, AKA piece one, to fit the back panel. They refer to all the pieces by numbers within the instructions, which gets confusing fast. <laughs> the next instruction, which is still part of step one, is match V and large O. Leave left seam free below large O. Make bound buttonholes in right front three between small O's. I did up the side seams first, and the whole don't sew below the small O bit has to do with leaving the lower portion of the left seam open to allow for that stupid placket. 
I really hate pockets. Why would you have buttonholes and pockets? You didn't have time for punctuation, but you had enough time to do that? Anyway, I marked buttonholes onto the material, then cut several small rectangles of the material to serve as binding for the buttonholes. I actually have another video coming up next in this series that goes into the bound buttonhole process in more detail. So for this video, I'm just going to read to you their instructions for bound buttonholes. Step one, mark buttonhole with thread or chalk. Step two, baste binding over thread, right sides matching, stitch 1 8 of an inch above and below the thread and at ends. I skipped the basting part of this step. Step three, slash through center to 1 8 of an inch from ends and diagonally at corners. Step four, pull binding to inside, form pleated ends, baste, and press. And then they just say finish of buttonhole. That actually covers the process pretty well, I must say, even if it is a little bit vague. I think bound buttonholes are a bit intimidating, but they do look very nice and they get easier the more you do them. It's all about practice and picking stiff enough fabric so that they aren't absolutely miserable to do. That definitely helps. <laughs> we are now officially on to step two. They say, stitch facing to unnotched edges of five, trim seam and turn, baste collar to neck, match V and center backs, collar optional. Piece five is the collar, so I'm pinning and stitching the collar pieces together with the right sides facing each other, then sewing a half inch away from the edges. I clip the corners and turn the collar the right way out. Then it's pinned into the neck of the bodice and basted down. Yes, I did actually baste this. It is a truly rare sight, like me leaving the house. The facing instructions are kind of extensive. They say, stitch under half inch at shoulder and longer side of facing four. Baste four to neck front edge of bodice. Match V in center front. Baste bias facing to back of neck. Extend bias half inch over facing four. Stitch bias and facing four. Trim seam, turn bias and facing three to inside. Turn in free edge of bias, slip stitch bias in facing four, slash facing at buttonholes, turn in one eighth of an inch and slip stitch to bindings. Lap right front bodice over left, match centers and baste. Gather lower edge of bodice between notches. That is step two. So I went ahead and pinned the facing into the bodice. As you can see, they don't extend all the way around, so I cut bias binding to fill in the back portion. This is pinned on and I trimmed the excess away. The whole edge was stitched across with a half inch allowance. I trimmed the corners and notched the edges and turned the facing inward. I pinned it so the edges were even, then tucked the raw edge of the facing inward so it was nicely finished. I hand stitched the edge of the facing to the bodice using slip stitches. I cut little slits in the facing for the buttonholes, then turn the edges inward and hand stitch them down with more slip stitches. This is my least favorite part of bound buttonholes. Lining them up is a pain and it's so hard to get them from looking even and pretty from the interior. And though practice has definitely improved how my buttonholes look from the right side, they still don't look too great from the interior. I lapped the left side over the right, then gathered the lower front edge as they instructed. Step three has to do with the skirt, which we already did the majority of. So the only portion of this step left to follow is match notches, side seam and centers, overcast seams, in reference to stitching the bodice and the skirt together. I actually found the waistline of the bodice was slightly too small for the skirt, but it fit me really well. So I gathered the back panels of the skirt down ever so slightly so I could get the pieces to line up. This doesn't mess with the silhouette too much and really improves the fit. At least at the waist it does. I pin the pieces together, then stitch them together by machine. 
My serger is on a high shelf and requires more time to thread than I was willing to invest, so I covered the raw edges with lace binding instead. They don't mention buttons until much later, but I wanted to do a fitting, so I decided to sew them in at this stage. And the buttons I picked are bright green vintage Lansing buttons that I bought on Etsy. They really bring out the green and the flowers, and I love them a lot. I also chose to do the placket at this stage. Their placket instructions consist of make placket. Thanks. To do this, I cut bias strips out of my remaining fabric. These were sewn together, then pinned into the side opening of the dress. I stitched around the opening with a half inch allowance. One edge is turned inward entirely to create a flat bias finish, and the other is folded over the material like a normal bias bound edge. Raw edges are folded inward and I whip stitched everything down by hand. I stitched a hook and bar into the edges. The side with the flat bias should lap over the other, hiding any evidence of the finishing. I stitched a few snaps in just to prevent the edge from popping open and showing any skin. On to sleeves! They say to seam sides of 6, gather upper edge between large 0, and hem lower edge. Here I'm marking the perforations, then stitching up the side seams, which were, of course, ironed open. I also ironed the bottom edge upward to create a nice hem. The hem was rolled inward by 3 quarters of an inch and pinned into position. Then I stitched it by hand using slip stitches. Instead of gathering the sleeve cap while the sleeve was flat, I pinned the bottom of the sleeve into the arm side, then gathered the top to fit the remaining opening. I like this method since the sleeves are really subtly gathered, usually just enough to curve the sleeve around the shoulder and add a bit of volume, without having visible gathers. It's hard to do that without a reference for what it needs to be gathered down to, and even when you have that it can be difficult to get things to line up. This method is pretty much foolproof. I matched up all of the V's and VV's and large zeros and small zeros and pinned everything into position. I stitched them on by machine with the recommended allowance and covered the raw edges with lace binding, since this portion tends to get a lot of abuse and the fabric can become very prone to fraying. The last step was hemming. They didn't say much about this process, so I chose to turn the bottom edge inward by an inch using my iron. Then I folded it inward by a full 4 inches to get my desired dress length. The hem was stitched with whip stitches, and I eased the curves to get it to lay flat. Then it was ironed and the dress was complete. Overall, I really like this dress. I realize it's a somewhat costumey interpretation of the 40s, thanks to the fabric, though it's not an inaccurate material for the decade. Just look up feed sack dresses and you'll be surprised by how colorful and ridiculous prints could get in the 30s and 40s. And though that part might not be to everyone's taste, I think the shape and pattern is quite flattering, and it's just a fun dress all around. I paired it with a vintage belt, a matching brooch, and the perfect pair of pumps, which are almost identical to the ones shown on the pattern artwork. And all together, it's a pretty cute ensemble, at least in my opinion. My favorite part is probably the pockets. I think they add a really cute detail to it. And of course the shoes, because shoes. 
As I said in the intro, this is one of several patterns in the 40s that I'll be following. Next up is a blouse, and then a pair of pants, and then a romper, and then probably another dress because I want to make all of the 1940s things. So if any of that interests you, then I hope you'll subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, then giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. So thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to all of you very soon. Please explain yourself, Gwen.